and you're active. I just tagged you to. Okay, let's see how it works. Anyway, before anybody comes in, where were we? I love the pool. I think it's beautiful. It's gonna look great in your yard. What are you gonna do about the landscaping? So, and don't forget lighting around the rest of your property too. I'll figure out a way to do that. One thing I did, I started the project and I didn't have lighting and AV worked out. So I will go ahead and add that to the plan. You don't have to follow it, but if you wanna get the wiring done, you can already have it done. Then it's a matter of adding pieces because the wiring for that took some extra work. And the lighting on the deck or? The lighting for the rest of the yard. Like if you think you're gonna want, I mean, that's a pretty good sized lot. I think it's close, a little bit bigger than my lot. And that gets expensive. You're running lighting, you gotta make sure you've got, um, you know, the extra, might need an extra breaker or you might just need extra, um, uh, might need an extra panel for your lighting. So go ahead and just get somebody out there that knows what they're doing. Wow. Well, there was a woman that said she was gonna pop in about 6.20. I hope she can, but um, you and I can just talk until somebody else comes in. But I did wanna set that up. Today's talk was supposed to be about um, setting up your, well, first you set up your goals, you identify what they are, because I have that 10 part strategy. I don't know if you've seen that on the Picronomics thing. But the second part, which is, make sure you know how to accomplish your goals. So if you have these long life spanning goals, you break those up into little pieces and the milestones and the bites that are manageable. But if you've set the long-term goal first and then you're taking your bites in the correct direction, sometimes whatever your endeavor is, you might go off track, it might fail, it might not perform as you want it to, and so that's why it's always good to have that long-term goal in front of you so you can get back on track, making sure you're heading to the right place. And a woman that's gonna come on at 6.20 is gonna talk about what happens when you don't have that clear plan going into an endeavor and things can go awry. So I was hoping, let's see, there's someone, hey, Rhonda is watching. Hey girl, um, she's on, so Rhonda's on Facebook and I'm on Zoom. Rhonda, if you want to join Zoom, you can. If not, you can just stay there. I hope you're doing well. It's good to see you on. But um, anyway, there's a really big uh, pit waiting for you if your interim goals don't match your long-term goals. A lot of times people will ask themselves, what do I want to do in two months? What do I want to do in a year, six years, whatever? Now I say start with end of life. Hey, Tammy, how's it going? I say start with what you want to accomplish in the end of life and then break that down into the interim goals you want to accomplish. Um, let's say, for example, and this is my go-to one because it just permeated every part of my life, was I wanted to raise safe, productive members of society for children. That was the goal. So we had to define it so we would know it would be successful or not. And then we had to determine what steps along the way we needed to make, what milestones we needed to accomplish in order to know we were on the correct path. And we already had Jacqueline, my, my oldest, by the time we set that goal and Jacob wasn't quite coming, but we knew we had this daughter. And so for example, same productive members of society, oh sorry, same productive independent members of society, we want these people out of the house, we don't want them coming back and staying. Um, for us, it started with sleep habits, and we read this book, uh, there's a series of books called the Baby Wise Books. And so we started with that book, and it had a structure for how to get your kid to be able to fall asleep on its own. And that's really important, because if your child cannot fall asleep on its own, you're constantly there, you're not um, putting into that independent nature the kids needed. A lot of times people want their children to fall asleep while they're eating. And this had a different setup. 
the kid wakes up, eats, plays, and then is able to put themselves to sleep. And if they're able to put themselves to sleep without needing the coddling of the parent, that is a good groundwork for them. So the first couple of nights with my daughter on this Baby Wise program, she screamed for hours. First night, I think she screamed for like six hours. The second night, for like two hours. And the third night, she got it. She was like, we're not coming in there. And it was really, really hard to do. And the way we were able to make sure we accomplished that small goal, which seemed really big, but that small goal of making sure they slept or making sure she slept was to realize being able to put themselves to sleep and to get good sleeping habits is a part of being a sane, productive, independent member of society. So that's one of those bite-sized goals that goes along with accomplishing the long time, long-term goals. I can't see if anybody's written anything. So glad. So does anybody have any questions from what I just said there? I gotta look at my phone, and my webcam, and my phone, and my webcam. I'll figure out how to do this. No questions? Okay, I'll just keep talking. Fallon, do you have a question? Because you're on the mic here. We can hear you. Oh, man. Okay. So I was hoping someone could suggest a long-term goal that they have or any long-term goal, and we can start to unpack, unpack that as an example. Or I can go along with the kids' example if you want, whichever. What do you think? If you have an idea on Facebook, write it in so I can see it. If not. No one has a suggestion? Okay, back to the kid example. So like I said, sleep, good sleep habits were a part of it. We also, my husband and I, decided that corporal punishment would be part of our regimen for our kids. Some people decide we're not gonna spank our kids and that's them. We had that, both of us, my husband and me, grew up in households where spanking was part of the discipline process but we decided it would be a strategic part of the discipline process. So it would happen under certain um, infractions and those only. And we would never ever spank our child or our children while we were angry or out of control. So it had, we had to be thinking strategically when we administered the punishment. One of the things that we said that we were punished for was disrespect because it's important in order to be a sane, productive, independent member of society that you have a respect for authority that begins in the home. And if you don't have a child that respects your authority, you're not gonna be able to teach them to respect outside authority and they won't be able to become those productive members of society. Now, I'm not saying that we're trying to raise children with no backbone. We do want the children to be able to stand up for themselves and grow up into free thinking adults. But first and foremost, they have to accept when they have to bow to authority. And if they do, how to do so in an independent way that's still respectful to the person of authority. Um, one of the things that we taught our children, my husband and I weren't necessarily in agreement, but I come from a Southern mother, which is yes ma'am, no ma'am, yes sir, no sir, are a part of how you respond to adults. And one of the things we ran into was being around adults who didn't grow up with yes sir, no sir, etc. And they would say things like, you don't have to say sir, you don't have to call me Mrs. So-and-so. And that's fine for their kids. And so we had to develop habits that was like, I understand that's not something that's part of what you and how you run your house. However, when we run our house, it is, <laughs> thank you Don, when we run our house with our children, they are respectful to adults. How we teach them to show respect is this. I hope that you can accommodate that. If not, then that would be someone that we didn't bring around our children. And it was just as simple as that. That's how it had to go. Um, what's another thing that has to do with our children? So there was, um, uh, uh, respect for authority, they had to show that and they had to show respect for other people's property. And I don't know if you guys know of people who have children that come and they just tear a house up. They tear up cabinets, furniture, clothes, whatever, because they are completely out of control. 
and we believe that teaching respect for others' property was a part of being a sane, productive, independent member of society. How do you have someone that can function in society if they don't respect property and other people's property? So that was one. There's a long list. That's just a few examples of how we matched our long-term goal. We identified with what those parameters would look like if successful, and we started back on how to accomplish it. Now, when they were babies, we had certain steps. When they were elementary school, that respect for authority in the home translated to respect for authority in the schools. We did not want our children disrespecting teachers. It didn't mean they didn't have disagreement with teachers, but they always had to show respect. And our kids knew that we were collaborating with their teachers to guide them. I don't know how many times they heard that. And I made a point to talk to the teachers. That's another step that we took. It wasn't like, here you have my kids, but I made a point to meet every teacher and say, these are the expectations we have for our children. I want to be your partner in making sure those children live up to these expectations. I'm not worried about these other babies over there. I'm worried about these particular babies right here. Help me raise them in the style that we wish to have them raised. And in all the years of my children's growing up in Frisco ISD, I only had a problem with one instructor and he was just a problem period. I just, I don't think that he believed in the values that we had for our kids or he wanted to undercut their independence and their vibrancy. Whatever it was, I had problems with one teacher and that was the senior year of my daughter. Well, he was also my son's instructor in band. Um, that's when the mama bear in Julie and the Papa Bear and Andre came out and we had to have a talk with that instructor and it was not collaborative, but we were still keeping with our goals. So sometimes when you run into an obstacle like that, a teacher or a coach that is not in keeping with your values, you have to know that if it's on one of those serious fault lines, a long authority for us was a fault line, had to be addressed, then you go in there and you make sure you have to deal with that teacher Having that strategy in your mind helps you phrase how you approach that teacher. I don't believe in going in with the angry woman thing, but I was very precise in letting him know how he needed to behave with the picture kids. And Andre, my husband, was there to back that play solidly and had a few words man to man with the teacher of his own, which I just loved. Anyway, it's 619 and Don, thank you for coming. Um, maybe you could come into the, uh, the Zoom. If not, we can see if you can talk on uh, Facebook Live. But Don had something to share, and I hope you still can, about what happens when you don't have your goals identified before you go into an endeavor and that endeavor goes awry. So Don, if you can either come in or... She wants to be in the video. Okay, so this is my first time here. How do I do that? Let's see, I'm approving you. I'm going to send invite. Come on. I'm learning stuff. This is cool. So Don, hey. Hi, Julie. How are you? Good. Better now. Okay, everybody, this is Don. Don, right now we have Fallon Hi, and Fallon. Tammy, and I think mm -hmm. Rhonda's still on here. So if you could, I ask you, and I thank you for being willing to share the story, five minutes or however mm -hmm. much you have time of what happened when that goal or that endeavor went awry and maybe how it could be avoided with a clear idea of what you wanted to or what that person needed to accomplish. So, so thank you, Julie, um, for even asking that I share. Um, I do appreciate um, all of your guidance because you didn't have to extend yourself. Um, <clears throat> that was a lot of late nights. <laughs> um, and, and, and honestly, it was a, a almost a dream, um, of mine that I thought was going to be fulfilled a lot differently. Um, I've always had, um, uh, uh, a goal to flip a property. I just wanted to flip a property. Didn't have the financing to do that. So through real estate, I wanted to work with investors and that would be my in to flipping a property, right? Because I'd be assisting them, providing a service and assisting them to do that. 
And so I thought with all of my experience that um, I would be able to support and guide and really, really um, be successful in this transaction because I did all my due diligence. Well, I thought at that point I did my due diligence, right? Um, to identify a property that met the criteria, my um, fail safe, essentially, if it was a good deal was that, hey, the lender wouldn't lend if it wasn't a good property. They essentially ran numbers. They essentially made sure that the financials were strong and that they would get paid back, right? So I did my part on trying to identify a property that met specific um, value criteria. The client submitted it to the um, uh, loan officer and it got approved. So I'm like, okay, great. We're gonna make some money, okay? And, <laughs> and that was the last of that, right? Um, this is a market where it should be a seller's market. The property is in a, a, a good area, decent area, um, where the, the numbers showed a good return and low days on market. Um, but with um, some decisions that were made, um, things that were not accounted for in um, profit, not accounted for in the budget of renovation, especially, um, and just some unforeseen issues with the buyers um, that caused delay after delay after delay. And uh, any delay is costly. Um, even down to utilities costing more than what we anticipated. Um, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was really, if anything, and the kitchen sink was thrown at us. And, and, and um, you know, it was thousands of dollars. Just not some, you know, a couple of hundred dollars, a thousand dollars on both sides of the transaction um, for myself and my client. So um, when they say, uh, the, you know, uh, the, the experience is priceless and invaluable, yes, but it's still painful. It's still painful. It's still painful. And so um, just a few of the pain points. One contractor. Oh, my God. Um, only wanted the money only identified cosmetic issues so that he can make the most money off of it instead of those those big fives which he said were absolutely fine and they were not they actually cost us um you know foundation hvac the roof um the plumbing <laughs> um all of it something was wrong but we had a nice kitchen we had a nice kitchen <laughs> just wasn't functioning um so the contractor <laughs> um blew the budget on the renovation um due to the big five um and then another pain point was the buyers um even though we you know did due diligence on connecting with the lender making sure they were solid buyers um we had and i tried to go back we had at least um eight offers um we had um four buyers we went through four buyers first buyer well maybe six because two of them tapped out after the inspection mm -hmm. even though i provided the inspection report before they made the offer um i actually provided hey this is what the last person did here's a little heads up even after that two of them pulled out in the option period so again, time wasted, right? Um, first buyer, we got all the way up to um, closing and the appraisal came back low, ridiculously low. And I had comps to support it. Um, it was a, a, a VA loan and they would, they would, I mean, they made us do termite um, corrections. They made us do all kinds of corrections and then turns out the appraisal comes in low. Second one was um, we get all the way up to almost closing and they said the roof wasn't insurable and they couldn't get insurance. And the reason why they couldn't get insurance um, is the reason why they couldn't get approved. Um, and that was pretty painful. Um, and then this last one almost fell apart um, because they missed their closing date. Um, the lender ended up saying that they didn't have information, they didn't have any title commitments at the last minute. Um, we had title issues, like we, we had everything, we had everything. So 
Um, I think, you know, you have these dreams, you have these goals, you see opportunities present themselves, and sometimes you have some blinders on. Um, you don't have all the information, so you, you need it. And um, even the information that you do have, you think you're getting solid information and you think you're making the right decision, but then something else comes up. So there are things, are unforeseen things that are going to happen regardless, but there's still things you can do to minimize and mitigate them with the right support um, and team and coaching. So, so if you had to start over, what are three big major strategic things you would change about the way you approach to that endeavor? Because I'm, I'm, I'm not new to real estate, but I'm new to flipping um, or even short term, long term, I would get a coach because time is money and I don't have time vetting a million people, you know, pulling things together and trying to then Google and research, getting a mentor, somebody that's done tried and true that can give me that information that I need and it actually be correct is one. Mm -hmm. The second thing is um, obviously an inspection um, through the individual contractors that can tell me specifically what the heck it's is wrong. It's really there, huh? Yes. That is like my, because if, if it kills the budget, it kills my bottom line. Yep. So that's a must. Um, and then thirdly is, is the team. Like I have to have things in place, people that I can, you know, trust and rely on that aren't going to be a part of the problem. Yep. I have a whiteboard over here. So I'm, I'm anyone who's been to my, my office, that's my, office that's a house knows that I'm constantly writing stuff on whiteboards and stuff like that. So um, I know quite a bit about this endeavor that Dawn's talking about, and I'm not going to violate any confidentiality. I just want to talk about the three things that you mentioned or that you would have had a coach, right? So Dawn said that she was experienced in buying and selling real estate as a realtor. Mm -hmm but she was representing a client that was doing a flip, which was not somewhere that she knew. So that point where she was working as someone that she had no experience, a coach would have been very, very, very useful there. Someone that knows how to do a flip. And so one of the examples she said she ran into was the contractor issue. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about real estate here. Um, when you do a major renovation, I never believe as an experienced investor to go in and tell the contractor, tell me what it needs. I go in there and I say, this is what I want you to do because I have determined the scope of work and you bid it out based on the information I have given you and I want to see your line items. And then I want to see your referral, your references. That's a new client. You have to, sorry, a new contractor. You have to vet your contractor. When you work with them a while, you can relax on that process but here's a lesson that I've learned. If that contractor has gone through a major life event, divorce, start using drugs, lost a child, whatever, feel sympathy for them, and then don't use them. Because invariably, those life hiccups impact the work they do for you. And that's just the way it is. You can be empathetic and supportive and all that, but with thousands and thousands of dollars, maybe not with that. You, you know, bring them some tips, treats, cookies, and, and go talk to them or something, but you don't bring them into your project. Another thing you talked about as far as the loans, the VA and the FHA, if you've been working with a coach, you probably would have known that when VA appraisers or FHA appraisers go to look at flips, they are really, really, really hard on the flips. One, because they know it's been recently purchased and some work done and two chances are that person who's selling it hasn't lived in it so they have they don't they aren't really able to disclose what's wrong but something is going to be wrong if you get a new construction home and nothing ever goes wrong that first year you're lucky but what you want to make sure is you have a warranty in place and that somebody can come back and fix it that's what you want in a new construction home you don't get warranties like that except for those home warranties you buy that are no good after a flip because they don't address the things that a flip has done. And so most flippers don't accept VA or FHA loans. 
for the most part. Some that believe in their work do, but the rest of them are like, you know, there's too much of a time delay that they require. And if they've done that flip fast, then that's going to interfere with the time. And because those, those appraisers, those VA and FHA appraisers go in there looking for problems beyond just the valuation. So that's kind of something that you not want to do if you're a new flip, but if you are an experienced flipper, then you're okay with VA and FHA because you've taken care of the big five that Don mentioned, and I don't know if everybody knows what they are, but when you're going to renovate a house, you need to make sure your foundation is solid. You need to make sure your plumbing is solid, that sub slab and within the house. You need to make sure your electrical is good. You need to make sure your roof is reasonably new. So one thing you talked about was the lack of insurability of the house due to the roof. You can always get insurance, even if the roof sucks, but you can't get insurance that fits within the budget of the buyer. So maybe as a new, um, what is it, investor, you get what's called a clue report. Experienced investors have relationships with insurance agents that will run if they do enough business, a clue report and let them know what's in the history of that property. And so they will know if there will be a problem trying to renovate, sorry, trying to sell that property and the insurance is going to be high. Your best bet when going with that insurance company is if there's a file in that house, and this is not guaranteed, but you can say, well, if the roof is bad, I've replaced the roof. If there was a hailstorm where they just replaced the roof, then I can verify that it's new. If there's been water damage, I can verify that I fixed it. These things go a long way to decreasing the cost of insurance for the buyer of the house. That has to be part of your calculation. Because if you're in a price range where they can't pay that high insurance, you're going to run into problems with someone trying to buy it. Uh, the title issues with the lender, um, I think that's your title company. So you have to make sure that on your team, are the people that can perform. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't get how important title person is. That's why I like to use my same title person. Somebody else might offer um, a discount on title costs, but for me, I really like to use the one I know that if there's a problem, this person will straighten it up for me. So that that's a big deal. Yep. Um, and you get that experience with a coach. The second thing that Don talked about was having an inspector being able to do due diligence on a flip is crucial because you are getting a budget, you are getting lending for the most part based on your assessment of what that house needs. And if you're not experienced with it, we'll go back to the coach part. You're gonna run into a house where you've like, I've made a pretty kitchen and a pretty master bedroom and bath, but I've got substandard plumbing, electrical and roof, and that's gonna kill your deal. And in order to sell it, you're going to have to either fix that or severely discount the price. Either one of those bite into your, your, your profits, which for the most part, I think is the reason why people want to do flips is to make money, not just to provide a pretty house to somebody and lose money on it. That's my thought. And then having the right team in place. If you have a coach and experienced investor helping you and they're willing to leverage your, their team, that helps. But if you're new, then there's a whole process to try to vet a potential team member and you still need a coach to be able to go and look at that person's work and say whether or not it's good. Because right now I can walk into a flip and I can look at it and say, I wouldn't sell this to a client of mine because I can see where they've cut corners. But if you're not experienced in that, you're not going to see that. And chances are, unless it's a VA or FHA loan appraiser, they might miss it either. A lot of these appraisers, they're just looking for condition, number of bedrooms, bath, square footage, um, looking at comps. They're in and out of that house like in 10, 15 minutes. So they're not looking at the condition of the house. Whereas the VA and the FHA appraisers, they're ensuring that someone can pay for that house. That's that extra fee you pay when you have an FHA upfront mortgage insurance or the VA has also mortgage insurance. They're guaranteeing if that person can't pay, they're going to pay that mortgage. And then if the house has serious fundamental problems, 
they don't have a lot of money in it, they have a higher likelihood of saying we're walking away from the house, regardless of credit. So they're trying to make sure that house is going to pass muster if they have to take it back and resell it. They don't want to sell lipstick on the pig. They want to sell something that works when they sell it to the next person, if they have to take it. So um, thank you, Dawn, for sharing. Um, the client that went into this deal, I don't think, in my opinion, was clear on what she wanted to accomplish because she wasn't clear there. She wasn't clear on her various exit plans. If you go into a flip, you need to either have a margin so big that you're going to you know, make money no matter what you do, or thank you, Don, for coming, or you're going to have to be able to have another exit strategy, either rent it or owner finance it or any number of things. Be able to reduce the price if you have to. You have to be able to come out on the other side. So that's kind of my thing on that. And an experienced person will help you. If you're going into a flip to make money and it's your first flip, you should pretty much count on breaking even if possible and learning. And someone who is experienced can tell you. If you're going into a flip and you're, you've got some experience and you're going into there to make money, well, that's great too, but you need to understand how that money that comes into your pocket impacts your overall financial structure. And that's one thing people don't talk about. If you go into a flip and you're successful, and let's say you make 50 grand and that takes you into the next income bracket and you're self-employed, so you're paying that self-employment tax and depending on where you start with your tax bracket, you're paying alternative minimum tax. So you taxed all the benefit out of your flip, even though the flip was successful. What do you do? You've not accomplished your goals. I am not a flip person. I believe in the buy and hold. I like getting the equity. I like getting the long-term cash flow. That is consistent with my goals for when I go into investing. But there was one time I went into a house. It was out in Fort Worth. I spent more money than I wanted to do because there was a lot more going wrong with it. And I said, hey, I'm not going to get the rent that makes sense. And I sold it. In retrospect, I should have kept it. The rents over the past, I think, two years since I bought it or sold it would have made up for that extra money. So now I look really, really hard before I sell a property. My goal is to keep them. I don't want to hop in and out of properties. I want to acquire properties that I want to keep. So any questions about that? You can either show up in the uh, chat or Fallon, you can just unmute because I've been doing a lot of talking. So any questions? No questions, no comments, no anything. Okay, well, that was pretty much what I had. I hope it communicated how important that it is to have your long-term goals in place and to understand how to break down those goals into the interim milestones and steps you need to accomplish to get there. And if no one has any other comments, because that's the big part of what I like to get are the comments and questions. I don't I have anything else to chat about tonight. Does anybody have anything they want to say? All right, then I hope that this was valuable and I hope to see you guys next Thursday. And I'm just going to end it here. Everybody, happy new year. Thank you for joining and I hope to see you next Thursday. Okay, take care, bye-bye.